This is a short video on how to use JUMP when you're trying to conduct a two-sample t-test for means, and that's in the specific case today when we are assuming unequal variances or unequal standard deviations in the population. So this is that assumption that sigma 1 does not equal sigma 2. So this is based on the exercise.jump dataset, which is available online, and it contains my workout stats from late 2012 for both run and cycling training. So this is data that we've looked at before in previous videos. One variable that I measured for both my cycling and running training was my elevation gained in feet, which indicates how much I climbed over the course of a workout or on a given route. So this is a cumulative measure. The more I climbed, even if I went downhill later, the higher my elevation gained total. And so the question is, is there evidence at the 0.01 level that I gained more elevation when cycling than when running on 2012 on average for a route? So that seems like a fair question. So my null hypothesis is going to be phrased to answer that. So this more, this is a greater than sign. And greater than does not include an equality, does not include equals to. So this must go in my alternative hypothesis. So I already know what my alternative will be. My alternative is that cycling was more than running. So that will be that mu cycling is greater than mu running. And if we're going to do this in terms of parameters, that will be that the mean of cycling minus the mean of running is greater than zero. So the parameter I'm estimating is mu c minus mu r. So my null hypothesis then must be complementary to my alternative. So my null hypothesis is that mu c is less than or equal to mu r. So in terms of the parameter I'm estimating, that means that mu c minus mu r is less than or equal to zero. So now I have it in terms of a parameter versus a hypothesized value. So this is in the same form we're used to. So I've got a parameter compared to a hypothesized value. Note, I could have also done this as run versus cycling. So this null hypothesis could just as easily been set up as mu r greater than or equal to mu c, or mu r minus mu c greater than or equal to zero. Because that's still getting at that my null hypothesis, mu c is less than or equal to mu r, so here mu c is less than or equal to mu r, I've just changed the order of my subtraction. And that means that for my alternative, my comparison could just as easily have been mu r less than mu c, meaning my parameter would have been mu r minus mu c is less than zero. So I could have done my subtraction either way. The important point is getting this comparison correct relative to the parameter you're estimating. And of course we define our parameters in context. So we say where mu c and mu r are the true average elevations gained on a route in 2012 by Megan for cycling and running respectively. And now our hypotheses are done. The next step in any hypothesis test is to name your test. And so our test is going to be just a two sample t-test for means. And then we come down into our assumptions. So we have assumptions that are required to make the test to answer that question that we had uh, uh, valid. So first we need a quantitative response. And we're dealing with elevation gain as our response. So how much elevation did you gain or did I gain on each of those rides and each of those runs? And since this is measured in feet, this is a numeric variable, this is certainly quantitative, we're good to go there. The next assumption is that I have independent and random samples. So I can check independence by thinking, well, when I did a bike ride, 
did I also run on that bike? And I'm not that talented. I certainly didn't. And then on the days that I ran or on those runs, was I also riding on those activities? And I, again, I'm not that talented. So I certainly have satisfied that independence assumption. Now, in terms of random samples, we aren't really told about this, but I can tell you that I did take a random sample from all of the rides that I did and all the runs that I did. So unless we're told explicitly, this might be a true assumption. We've satisfied that here. Now, in order to use the t-test, we need to assume that we have approximately normal populations. So that means that the elevation gained for bike rides and the elevation gained for run activities are both normal. So we have to talk about both populations now. And again, we're not told this, so this is another true assumption because we don't know what those distributions really look like. And finally, we need to check our standard deviations. So we're going to check that S max over S min. So we want to know, is sigma 1 equal to sigma 2? Or is it at least safe to assume that? So we're going to go to our data set in jump to figure that out. So here are the exercise data in jump. You can see that we have running data, cycling data, and a couple walking exercises, but these little red no ghosts, ghostbuster signs means that we're not looking at the walking. So we're just looking at the running and the cycling activities. So to get the standard deviations for running and cycling broken out separately, we're going to go to Analyze, Distribution, and we're going to ask for elevation gain as our Y, because that's a responsive interest, and we're going to ask for activity type to be our grouping variable or by variable. So we're going to get summary statistics for our response variable broken out by each activity type. So we're going to get summary statistics for walking, uh, for running and summary statistics for cycling. So what we get is we have this first set and so we see for distributions activity type equals cycling we have the elevation gain information for cycling data. And we see that the standard deviation, because this is what we're interested in right now, has a standard deviation of 435. So let's write that down in our notes. And we can afford to be a little sloppy here just because the numbers are so big. And then, coming back here to jump, if we look at the activity type for running, so these are all the run information. We come down here and we see the standard deviation down here at the bottom is 120. So we go back to our notes again and we have S sub R equals 120. So we check S max over S min. That would be 435 over 120 and that's much, much greater than 2. So we assume unequal standard deviations. So sigma 1 is assumed to be unequal to sigma 2. So this is again another true assumption. We've done this kind of back of the envelope check. We just did a S max over S min kind of thing. But this isn't anything formal. We don't have a p-value. This is not a formal test. So I said this was going to be a video on how to use jump. So far we've only used jump to get the S max and S min. When you're using jump to conduct a test or to, to do the work for you, you still have to lay out the hypotheses, the test, the assumptions, and really do the conclusions. The only thing jump will do for you is some of the mechanics of the test. So those other remaining parts are still up to you, the human, to do. So before we get to jump, we still have to do those first two parts of mechanics. So we have to get our significance level, and we were told to test at the 0 0.01 level. So 0 0.01 is our alpha. And so that means we're going to reject the null hypothesis if our p-value 
is less than 0 0.01. We're finally at the point where we can go to jump and say, hey, do all the work for us. Because the test statistic and the p-value are the only things that jump will calculate for us. So we come back to our exercise data. To do a two-sample t-test in jump, we're going to use the analyze fit y by x. Because remember, this is a bivariate analysis. We have a x for our grouping variable, and in this case, that's the activity type. We've got two activity types, running and cycling. So that's our predictor variable, which kind of activity did you do? And then we have our response variable, which is our quantitative response, and that is the elevation gained. And what we're really asking is, is there an association between our predictor variable, our activity type, and that response or elevation gain. And if there is an association, that means that there is a difference in the average elevation gain for those two activity types. So we're fitting y by x. We're looking for a relationship. So here, our y or our response variable, that's our quantitative response, that's elevation gain. That's the one that we're calculating a mean for. An activity type, that's our categorical predictor or our x factor. And you can tell that we have a quantitative variable here because it's got in jump a blue scale, this little blue scale next to it. And anything categorical in jump is going to have a little red uh, histogram next to it. So that's a quick way to make sure that your data have been entered into jump correctly. And then we hit OK. So once we run that, we get this plot output. And this is the first thing jump gives you. And so we can see here, these are all of my cycling data that have been pulled from that cycling sample uh, population. So this is my cycling sample data. And these are all the elevations gained for all my run data. And you can see that, yes, we have a much bigger spread for cycling in terms of elevation gained than we do for running. This is a much tighter distribution for running than for cycling. There's a much bigger spread in that cycling sample. And that's why we're assuming that in the population, cycling also is going to have a much bigger standard deviation, or at least a different standard deviation. So this is a visualization of the data we have. So what do we do? There's no test here, and we want a t-test. We want to see, is the mean for this group different from the mean from this group? And specifically, we want to know, is the cycling average different from the running or bigger than the running average? So remembering that every red arrow is a pull-down menu, we click on the red arrow for the one-way analysis of elevation, and we click on t-test. And that gives us a t-test for our results. Now notice something here. This is telling us the order in which they compared. So we set up our original comparison using cycling minus running. So if we look at our original setup, our parameter of interest was mu c minus mu r. So we were looking for a right-tailed test in our alternative. So we wanted mu c to be bigger than mu r. In jump, however, we're being told that they did it in terms of running minus cycling. So they looked at whether running was bigger than cycling. So they did the opposite. They used that other setup for the parameter. And jump will always go in reverse alphabetical order. They will always use the later set minus the earlier set. So running comes later in the alphabet than cycling, so they did running minus cycling. If you had group A and group B, they would do B minus A. So here we have our point estimate. This is that difference, so this would be X bar running minus X bar cycling. This is the standard error of the difference. They give us a confidence interval, but this is not the confidence interval we want. We can change that alpha, so if you want to change the alpha, you would come up to that red arrow menu and say set alpha level and we want an alpha of 0 0.01 so that would give us a 99 percent confidence interval and we can see that that confidence interval is now changed so if you want a 99 percent confidence interval for the true difference in running minus cycling then we would have negative 303.39 to negative 778.13 if you want to fix a confidence level that's not one of these common ones you would go up to that red arrow menu set the alpha level and you can pick one so you can set your alpha level to be whatever you want, remembering that 1 minus this is your confidence level. So with an alpha of 0 0.01, you have 99% confidence. 
we're going to leave that at 0 0.01 for now. This T ratio, a T ratio is your test statistic. So if we did this negative 540.76 minus 0, the hypothesized value, and divide by the standard error of 86, we would get negative 6. And that means that we would have a test a point estimate that is negative 6 standard deviations away from the hypothesized value. And that's big. Here we can see that we have these wonky degrees of freedom. These degrees of freedom of 29.00715. That is not a whole number, and that's because they used the Welsh Satterthwaite correction, which you have to do when you assume unequal variances. So this is all consistent with what we've seen in the notes. Finally, Jump says, hey, we don't know what your p-value is, so we're going to give you all three possibilities. We don't know if you did a left-tailed test, a right-tailed test, or a two-tailed test. It's up to you to choose. We're not going to make that mistake. So they've given you this first probability greater than the absolute value of t. This is that two-tailed test. So if we had just looked, is cycling different than running, this would be our p-value. If we wanted to know, is running greater than cycling, because remember, jump set it up as running minus cycling, then we would do a right-tailed test running greater than cycling, and that probability would be 1. So we would have a very high p-value. And then if we want to know is running less than cycling, which that is what we want, is running less than cycling. So we want that left-tailed test based on how jump set it up. And so that left-tailed test for running minus cycling less than 0 has a p-value less than 0 0.0001. So pulling that jump output, and dropping it in here, we had our alternative hypothesis was that mu c minus mu r was greater than zero. But we said that this could be written as mu r minus mu c is less than zero. And this is consistent with how jump set up the difference. And so given this setup for that p-value, given mu r minus mu c, we know that we want jumps left-tailed p-value here. So our p-value is less than 0 0.0001. And this t ratio is our test statistic, t obs, for this setup. And so that's based on x bar running minus x bar cycling divided by the standard error of that point estimate here. And now we can draw our conclusions. So our conclusion, because we have this tiny p-value, or because our p-value is less than 0 0.0001 is way less than alpha, of 0 0.01, well, we reject that null hypothesis, which claims cycling is no better than running in average elevation gain. per root. There is sufficient evidence to indicate a higher average gain um, by cycling or a lower average gain by running.